Okay, so this video is going to be a bit different. It's going to be much more subjective than anything I've put out so far, and it might get a little weird later on, so there's your warning. <laughs> I'm willing to bet that most of you don't know anything about Mega Man Star Force, so I'll be spending a lot of time explaining things about it, but a lot of the things I really, really want to say are towards the end. So I hope you stick around until then. In case you don't know what Mega Man Star Force is, which, like I said, is probably the majority of you, it's a trilogy of Nintendo DS games that were released from 2006 to 2008 that were loosely part of the Mega Man series. It's kind of like how Mario Kart is technically a Mario game, but it's not like a Mario game, you know? It was heavily inspired by, or maybe just the spiritual successor to, Mega Man Battle Network, which is great, but the stories in those games are like, not as cool. The first games, I say games because there were three versions, but they were all identical plot-wise, follow a ten-year-old boy named Geostellar. He's a very whiny and even misanthropic kid who has been very upset ever since his dad, Kelvin Stellar, went into space on a mission and never came back. He isolated himself and wouldn't go to school, and his mom is like a wreck, but she tries super hard to take care of Geo and get him to make friends and be a normal kid. But one day, Geo is looking up at the stars through his visualizer, a set of goggles that let you see electromagnetic radiation, like radio waves and stuff, and a weird alien monster crashes down right in front of him. This alien is Omegasis, an FM Ian, like FM as in FM radio waves. He's from the planet FM. I know, just bear with me. Geo freaks out, but Omegasus convinces him to let him stay in his trancer, which is basically like a common smartphone type thing that you wear around your wrist. Anyway, the two get to know each other, and also it turns out that they have the ability to fuse together, or wave change, and become Mega Man, a blue guy who can travel on electromagnetic wave roads and fight viruses. The pair then fight other FMEans that inhabit other humans, but have much worse intentions and don't value human life in the same way that Omegasys does. Anyway, I'll talk more about the philosophical and psychological implications of what these villains represent later. For now, all you need to know is that Geo saves the day every single time, and at the end, he goes into space in order to fight King Cepheus, the king of Planet FM. It's revealed that Omegasys is actually from Planet AM, which is host to a race of electromagnetic beings called AMEans that King Cepheus had conquered save for four survivors, the three big awesome satellites that I'll probably talk about later, and Omegasis. This is likely the reason why Omegasis doesn't share the same hatred and contempt for humans as the other FMEans, because he's not one. Anyway, Geo defeats King Cepheus, and in one final glorious representation of the power of friendship, his friends and family and mentors and really everyone who has helped him along his journey all help him return to Earth with the power of their brother bands. By the way, a brother band is a connection between two trancers. It physically augments your power in battle as well. At the start of the first game, Geo has none because he can't bring himself to trust anyone, but by the end he overcomes his fears and maintains four brother bands with his friends. So I'm gonna entirely skip over the second installments in the series because they kinda suck, and you can just think of them as a continuation of the first one with a lot of the same themes from before. The only differences are that Geo is a little less whiny, only a little, and he has a little more faith in his friends except for one of them for some reason. The third installment, however, is Bananas. Believe me when I say I absolutely want to talk about the third game, but I want to keep this video at a length that corresponds to most people's attention spans. So like I said, we're going to stick with the first game from here on out. Probably the most important thing that is universal across all human Mega Man Star Force characters is that no matter what, they represent true humanity. Whether they're a villain or a hero, they're humans with flaws and weaknesses just like real people, and in the world of Mega Man Star Force, there's no such thing as a good person or a bad person. Except for maybe Kelvin Stellar, who is indisputably a good person and an awesome guy. Geo is the main hero, but he obviously starts out with many flaws. Flaws that could easily have turned him into a villain if any FMEan other than Omegasis encountered him first. Oh right, we should probably talk about the other FMEans. One of the first ones we ever see is Cygnus. Cygnus is a little swan-looking guy who comes to Earth to find Omegasis because of reasons I won't get into. Basically, he comes to Earth and finds a man named Tom who, like any other human, has weakness in his heart. He has experienced trauma and betrayal before and that led to him developing trust issues which he hadn't completely overcome by the time the game takes place. In the past, he worked for a company called NASA. It's NASA and produced some kind of invention that his boss claimed as his own. 
This especially hurt him because he looked up to and admired his boss during his time there, and that man was the only one who had ever really given him the time of day. Tom's life until that point had been lonely, and it left him especially vulnerable to his former boss's deeds. After quitting and finding a new job at Amakin, he somehow found a friend in Aaron Boreal, his new boss. He finds it very hard to trust Boreal, but eventually he slowly starts to convince himself that it might be alright to trust him. But right before he makes his final decision to do so, he encounters Cygnus. Cygnus feeds off of his unresolved trust issues and, during another vulnerable moment for Tom, convinces him that Boreal will also betray him given time. He gradually convinces Tom into believing that human society is based on betrayal and manipulation, and through fusing with him in the same way that Geo and Omegasus can fuse, he can become more powerful and leave humanity behind. Obviously, this is a very unhealthy way of looking at the world, but it's ultimately Tom's decision to look at it that way, even if Cygnus is very persuasive and cunning. This decision leads to him agreeing to wave change and then attempting to kill Boreal in a very roundabout and... creative way. Luckily, Geo changes into Mega Man and stops him, and Boreal gives his heartfelt speech about how it's important to trust others, and it makes him realize that human society isn't built entirely on exploitation and betrayal, but rather friendship and bonds. Tom apologizes and learns the error of his ways, and Cygnus is defeated. So, looking at this, you see that Tom is not a bad person, just someone who was hurt and taken advantage of by an external force. This actually leads perfectly well into the next talking point of this video, but I wanted to talk about one of the other characters first. Another FMEN we see in the first game is named Libra. Libra is a little scale thing who arrived on Earth for the same reason that Cygnus did, except that the human Libra decides to inhabit is Geo's teacher, Mitch Shapar. Mr. Shapar is widely regarded as the cool teacher of Geo's school because he does his best to make learning fun for his students. He values the enjoyment of his students almost as much as his own children, which is what Libra is able to prey upon when he comes to Earth. The school's curriculum undergoes a change that requires Shapar to teach certain material to his students, and if he doesn't raise their test scores to the required standard, he'll lose his job and not be able to provide for his children. This is a huge issue to him, because in order to teach the massive amount of new material to his students, he would have to take the fun out of it completely, and that's something he's not willing to do for the sake of his fun-loving ideals. Just as he's about to come up with a compromise between the two choices, however, Libra shows up and convinces him to simply forget the well-being of his students in favor of his own flesh-and-blood children. Shapar has a mental breakdown and agrees to wave change just like Tom did, and the next day in class, he activates something called the Study Wave, a program that forces the kids to study non-stop to the point of exhaustion and physical harm. Of course, Geo, being one of said students, enters the wave in Mega Man form and stops Mr. Shapar in the end. Every single main antagonist in this game has a backstory just as deep and emotionally charged as these. Queen Ophiuka results from Luna Platts, a child of rich parents, feeling underappreciated by said parents and struggling with the large expectations they set on her. This leads the FME and Ophiuka to take advantage of those feelings and cause her to harm the people she loves. Taurus Flame is born of Bud Bison's inferiority complex and his desire to prove himself useful to his friends when Taurus convinces him to wave change and destroy parts of their hometown. All of these stories have something in common though, and I've been kind of alluding to it, but I think it's time to dive in. So, the common thread uniting all of these antagonists is that a totally external and literally alien force comes into their lives during a time of uncertainty or self-doubt. With every case, these human characters are struggling against their own psyches, something that every single person has experience with. In Tom's case, he's led a life of isolation and loneliness, and after suffering trauma in his past, he allows Cygnus to persuade him into an irrational and wildly unhealthy worldview. It's not his fault, though. Cygnus is something separate from him, and that he doesn't have control over. Allegorically, I think these characters and the FMEans that inhabit them represent people that are suffering from neuroses and mental illnesses. The character of Tom could easily represent rejection-sensitive dysphoria, and I already said Bud Bison has an inferiority complex. I know it might sound a little silly to interpret a DS game made for children that was barely even translated correctly in this way, but if people can't even tell if the Spongebob Squarepants skin theory video is satire or not, then I'm sure at least some people won't call me crazy for interpreting Mega Man Star Force this way. Also, I'm not suggesting that every single one of these characters is actually suffering from depression or anxiety or something, but rather they're examples of how fragile someone's mind and personality can be and how easily they can fall into the pit of self-destruction that is neuroticism. 
every single time, they fall off the deep end and become irrational, beyond the point of reasoning, and it takes the kind understanding words of someone close to the person to bring them back to reality. This could metaphorically be interpreted as receiving help from a supportive friend or even practicing self-care. As every single time an antagonist is defeated, they realize the error of their ways for themselves after someone explains to them a misunderstanding or professes their forgiveness. It ties into the game's overall message about how important it is to share your thoughts and feelings with your friends so they can support you and keep you mentally well. Mega Man Star Force asserts that the solution to having a fragile psyche is simply having friends who care, having people who can share the burden of your emotional baggage so it doesn't weigh on you until you snap. And you know what else? Like I said, every one of these characters is just a normal human being who falls prey to their own brain and struggles to keep their own values straight within their mind. The game doesn't write these people as awful, terrible villains who are beyond redemption, but as victims of outside forces that they can't do anything about. This has a direct real-world parallel. Every single real-life atrocity that is committed, every crime, every betrayal, they're not committed by bad people. They're committed by people who have been deceived, people who were tricked, people who are too weak or vulnerable to resist the strength of the neuroses that would cause them to hurt others. People who just want to fit in and feel better about themselves. People who unwittingly allow others to manipulate them. Mitch Shapar is guilty of borderline child abuse, if not just child abuse, period. Does that make him a bad person? Some might say yes, but Mega Man Star Force says no. Mitch Shapar is a genuinely good man who cares for both his own children and his students and only wanted to do what he thought he had to do for the good of everyone involved. It was Libra who convinced him in the end to do what he did, and like I said, the FMEans themselves may as well be our own impulses or our own irrational thoughts that reside within the darkest corners of our minds every single day, if not just a mental illness. Sure, it was his choice to listen to Libra's words, but he only did so because of the pain and anxiety he felt about his situation. We've all been in a place like that before. I think the worldview that this game is operating under is one that more people could benefit from. Instead of blindly hating those who do evil, feel sympathy for how they've been hurt and understand that there is no such thing as a bad person. End of story. Every person you see, whether they're a murderer or a saint, they're all people. They all laugh and cry just like you do. They all have beliefs, they all have things they love and things they want to protect. And they all have moments of weakness just like you do. So it's not fair to just label people as bad because they've done something bad, even several things. Nobody is beyond redemption and forgiveness. Sorry if I got a little preachy there. That might have been the most religious sounding thing I've ever heard an atheist say. I just feel pretty strongly about my convictions about this sort of thing. I honestly think that as a kid I internalized a lot of what the story of this game was telling me, and I get that the writers almost certainly didn't mean for the FMEans to symbolize neuroses, but it's a creative angle of looking at it that just so happened to lead me into leading a life of empathy and understanding. It's almost become cheesy at this point to say things like don't judge a book by its cover or don't judge a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes, but I'll never stop championing the sentiments that these sayings convey. Human beings should all be able to understand each other and feel each other's pain, and even if we disagree on things, we should all recognize that the people we disagree with are people too. In fact, I'm reminded of the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows as Sonder, which is a term used to describe the realization that every single person you see is living a life as vivid and complex and consuming and overwhelming as your own. Friendship and empathy are probably the two most important things when it comes to living life in your best possible way. Humans need other humans. Mega Man Star Force did a great job of drilling us into my mind as a kid. When I was little, I did feel a little like an outcast for a lot of my school years, and seeing Geo, a kid who was exactly like me in the beginning, whiny and dramatic and lonely, learn the value of friendship was something helpful for me. And seeing all these evil looking monster people apologize and make amends after hurting the ones they cared about was helpful too. Granted, it might have been a while until I finally accepted the lessons this game taught me, but the seed had been planted all the way back when I first played it. It even played a part in me being super interested in astronomy when I was younger. Anyway, you've probably heard enough of me rambling about one of my favorite games of all time for now. I'll leave things off here. Thanks for watching. Later.